everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for my final episode of my COVID recovery series, where for the last two months, we've been bringing you uplifting stories of hope, of recovery, and interviews and conversations with movers and shakers from all around the world who are making a difference in the fight against this pandemic. Tonight, I'm really excited because I'm going to speak with an inspiring woman in the country that I'm in right now, Sweden. Uh, I will be bringing you an exciting conversation with Margot Wallström, who served as Sweden's foreign uh, minister, uh, former foreign minister. I'm going to read a brief bio about um, Mrs. Wallström because her uh, credentials and CV is so incredible, and I'm not sure if I can uh, say the whole thing from heart without a prompter, but uh, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to have her join the conversation in uh, our final episode. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Margot Wallstrom served as the former Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, in Sweden. Uh, in 2014, she coined and introduced uh, her infamous feminist foreign policy, um, a strategy that has since been picked up by other countries like Canada and France. In addition to her role as Sweden's, uh, Sweden's foreign minister and deputy prime uh, minister, uh, Minister Wallström has held numerous positions in the Swedish government, the European Commission, uh, and from 2010 to 2012, she served as the first ever UN Special Representative to the Secretary General on sexual violence in conflict, an incredibly important issue uh, that I think needs uh, more attention. Uh, during her tenure as Foreign Minister, Sweden also chaired the UN Security Council and also held Yemen peace talks here in Sweden. Uh, so with, with that said, uh, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Margot Wallström to this conversation. Let's see if we can bring her in. Ah, brilliant. I think we are waiting for Mrs. Wallstrom to join in. During our conversation, we're going to talk about uh, many issues, but of course, women empowerment leading uh, in the world of politics and foreign policy as a woman, and also the importance of uh, being an empathetic leader. So I absolutely can't wait to bring in Mrs. Wallstrom into the conversation and talk about everything that we want to discuss. In fact, let me see if I can do this this way. I think I can. Hello. Hey, hello. <laughs> How are you? Uh, Can you hear very me well. well. I'm good, thank you. And you? Good. In Sweden. Good. Thank yes, you for in inviting me. Oh, thank you so much for your time. It's such a pleasure to have a conversation with you on this platform, um, you know, during these times. So thank you so much for your time, Mrs. Wallstrom. My pleasure. Okay, well, let's just, you know, jump into the, to the conversation. Um, first of all, how are you doing? How's your family? Our situation in Sweden is a bit different than elsewhere in the world. We are, um, thank God, all well. Uh, and um, we um, have been for some time now in a kind of self-isolation um, with our youngest son. So... Um, uh, that uh, has worked really well, and uh, we've enjoyed that. But uh, of course, this is uh, every day. These news about people who who suffer and die from from the pandemic—it's um, 
it's a very serious situation and uh, I can see that um, there is uh, of course a very lively debate about how best to um, to fight a pandemic of this of this kind mm -hmm. no and, and we, we are going to talk about that absolutely I'm very curious to hear your thoughts um, but you know, one of the reasons that I really wanted us to have a conversation is uh, a lot of people uh, are, are seeking strong women, strong female leaders, and you certainly are one of those leaders. Um, you, you introduced a policy, uh, the feminist foreign policy, that's based on three R's. Can you tell us about those three R's? Because we are having an international audience, and I think they can take away from, from those three R's. Well, the moment you use uh, a word like feminist um, foreign policy, of course, uh, that will um, also be controversial in many places because uh, to be a feminist has, for some reason, a, uh, a negative connotation in, in certain countries and, and cultures. But it's important, uh, therefore, to immediately go to the definition of uh, what is uh, a feminist uh, being a feminist and, and what is feminism mm -hmm. and to me it's as simple as uh, women and men enjoying the same rights and obligations and opportunities and uh, when i formulated uh, a feminist uh, foreign policy it was from the it built on the understanding that more women means more peace um, we have a better chance of getting peace agreements to last longer if women are at the table where those are negotiated. And women are needed in, uh, as, as peacemakers and peacekeepers as, as well. So, um, and then the, these three R's are sort of the parameters with which we uh, measure and, and act um, uh, and that's uh, why we say it has to be a matter of checking do women and girls enjoy the same rights, legal rights, human rights as men and boys around the world. Uh, can they open a bank account? Can they have a business? Can they um, uh, avoid uh, child marriage? Can they can child, uh, girls go to school, etc., etc.? Then it's about representation. Are they there in parliaments and uh, in the context where important decisions are being made. And then thirdly, resources. Do the same resources go to the needs, to meet the needs of, of girls and, and women around the world? And I think that this made it a very practical um, tool and practical parameter. So they have been used um, by all our embassies around the world. And I, I think it still works. After five years, this is... Uh, something that, that, that is in the toolbox of uh, all our uh, embassies. It's brilliant that you say they're, they're tools because as you mentioned, either this conversation is controversial or people think of it as just you know, a conversation. They don't think that it can actually be implemented. And you know, being American and you know, having lived in the United States, I see this firsthand. There's a disparity with wages, there's a disparity with uh, you know, parental leave. There's so many disparities, even in places like the United States. So Mrs. Wall Wallstrom, what do you say to young American girls or young uh, girls anywhere actually in the world who may want to have these tools, but their governments are not necessarily taking this concept seriously? What should they do as they you know, go through life and go through, you know, their career? What, what should they look for? Well, they have to be sort of organized. They have to find their friends and they have to fight for their mm -hmm. rights. And they have to ensure that they can enjoy, for example, the same legal rights and opportunities. And I, I can say this much that in, in the United States of America, I would wish to see that there is an equal rights amendment uh, being passed. Uh, you, you have a chance of, of doing that soon. And uh, I think start. Opportunities uh, 
in the U.S. and elsewhere in in the world. But but to me again, it's it's a practical thing. We we have to to change the fact that women are discriminated against. They are paid less for doing the same jobs as as men. There is so much violence against uh, uh, girls and women around the world, and we see it now in uh, as an effect of uh, of uh, fighting the pandemic and with families being kind of isolated mm -hmm. and and this is and it's true also when they want to run for public office then there is so much of um, um, unfortunately so much of pushback uh, against uh, women candidates mm -hmm. and and even violence uh, women journalists are know this very well that they have sort of a double burden of both being uh, attacked because of the job they are trying to do, but also because they are women. So okay. we have a long way to go, but we can only do it if we organize ourselves and work together. Well, you did it, and you're a fantastic example of that. And I want to touch on that because, again, um, when I speak with young women, both in the U.S. and also in Europe, I think um, there is this fog of strong uh, men who are not empathetic, who are not necessarily character-driven leaders, but are governing, you know, some of the most powerful countries right now. And I think that might be intimidating for a young woman who wants to pursue a career in public service, who wants to, who wants to pursue a, a career in journalism even right now, with everything that we're hearing about, you know, fake news and all the attacks on, on journalism, or a uh, career in diplomacy and development. Uh, what is your message to those young girls and young women who are seeing these big guys out there who don't necessarily uh, value the, the elements that you and I are discussing right now? These are, the, these are today's autocrats, um, as I call them. You know, they, they gather more and more power to make sure that they can stay in office. They... <laughs> Um, actually go after especially the rights of, of uh, women uh, mm -hmm. as one of the first things they do. They, um, they restrict the right to abortion or sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, for, for girls and women, um, but also how they attack, uh, for example, those uh, organizations and women who defend women's rights and fight for women's rights. They're, there are no shortcuts. You, you have, we have to continue to fight for our rights. We have to continue to, to follow and choose leaders uh, that come with a different uh, message and, and with a different program and act upon that. So, so this is really about also fighting for democracy and our, our democratic rights because mm -hmm. these autocrats also start by restricting um, for example, free speech or meetings. And you see it in, in many places now around the world. And unfortunately, also as an effect or consequence of, of the pandemic. So it's a, it's a very serious situation in the world for, for democracy, for human rights, for free speech and, and for journalism, I would say as well, and for civil society organizations. But this is where we can... Uh, where we can start, where we can find friends and, and support and allies. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think they have they cannot give up. <laughs> it's also, yeah. we, we do have very strong organizations, very strong movements at the moment and, and excellent uh, women leaders as, as well that have come forward. I think especially now in this crisis, we've seen many women leaders. Exactly. And that's something I want to talk about. Though. You, you know, that's a great pivot to the next question. You know, we discussed this before together. Uh, in spite of, you know, all these uh, autocrats, uh, as, we, as we discussed, uh, there, there are strong female leaders out there who are stepping up and they did an amazing job in fighting the pandemic. You know, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, Angela Merkel in Germany, you know, in Denmark, Iceland. There are female leaders out there who are really doing an excellent job and being the definition of a true leader as they should be. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? How do you think female leaders um, can continue this momentum post-COVID? Mm. I, 
I think that those that you have mentioned are are amazing leaders. They have shown true uh, leadership uh, during these very difficult times. I think it starts by going your sort of own way, finding your your own expression, your way of talking about this and and leading your your country. And I think they've all done that in maybe somewhat different ways, but in in with their own sort of profile and with their hearts, because I really think well done by you, because you have also lifted the stories of, of all of the victims of the COVID. And I think we have to understand what what this does to to a society also. And, and all these people that we lose, they are uh, they will be missed by by people. They they affect all of us and how we think about the the crisis. And I think they've managed to show their hearts as well as good leadership in in all of this. Mm -hmm. It's such an important point you mentioned, uh, Mrs. Wallstrom, kindness, and that's something that I really want to talk to you about because people think that if you want to be a good leader, you have to be tough and and firm and fierce and and in essence lose empathy and your kindness, but you and your leadership technique and, and mode and even career throughout the years has, has proven that you can be all of that. You can have empathy, but you can also be uh, strong. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because we, we can't see true democracy without empathy, I think. It's important to be empathetic. No. I, um, I really think that being a leader and especially in a top position as for example prime ministers and presidents and so on uh, i've often said this i think it brings out the best and the worst in every person mm -hmm. and um and you have to know that because you have to know and understand your own strengths and your weaknesses mm -hmm. um, and i think that the moment you show that you are a, a true human being that you you're there with with all of your assets and also with your shortcomings. I think people will see that, and then you probably have to be tough at times. You have you have probably you will grow uh, stronger and and uh, uh, a bit more um, hardened by everything you go through. But uh, I really think they have managed to show that they are they are following their own path and their own hearts and never forget um, for whom you uh, are working you know that uh, this is uh, we are there for for people and for democracy and for the ideals that that we have have chosen as our political goals well unfortunately some people forget that so let's just hope that the young generation as they as they grow remember that um, let's talk about Sweden. You know, I've been here for the last two months and, you know, the show is aimed to talk about uplifting stories of those who recovered and, and ways that and people who are uh, fighting this, this horrible pandemic. Sweden has been quite unique in its approach. And, um, you know, I don't think anyone can really say if the strategy or policy is good or bad right now at this very second. I think this is a dis this conversation that we should have maybe six months from now or a year, but I really want to hear your, your thoughts on that. And, you know, the policy that Sweden is, is uh, approaching with the, uh, you know, the, the herd immunity. Well, uh, I am one of um, all those that can nowadays follow this only from a distance and as an ordinary person that uh, uh, that um, can read newspapers and and watch TV and try to understand what it is that it, that is going on um, although I have some insight also in sort of my political party and the leadership in my political party but from the very beginning I think the message has been very clear and consistent and the same throughout. Mm -hmm. uh, our government as well as the expert authorities have said there are a few things we have to do throughout. We have to make sure that we protect the most vulnerable mm -hmm. and it's very clear that this pandemic discriminates against older people, mm -hmm. that they are the most vulnerable. 
And from that point of view, of course, we have, we really, uh, we, we must say that it is a failure that we have so many uh, deaths, uh, um, you know, from the homes for, for the elderly. Secondly, we have to make sure that we don't put such a strain on our healthcare system that we cannot um, actually treat uh, all the, the patients and the sick uh, people. And we have managed to do that. We have managed to, um, to provide good healthcare. Um, and thirdly, of course, we do everything not to spread the virus, that we can uh, make sure that also in the long term, um, people in Sweden stay healthy. Um, and all of that um, has been repeated, I, I would say, every day at the press conferences that the government and, and uh, the authorities um, uh, carry out. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think there will be a lot to, to discuss uh, one day. And maybe, I mean, this is not a competition, as we've heard so often, but, but of course you compare and you look at what, what do other countries do? Are we... Um, are we special in one way or the other? Um, what is distinct about this particular development in, in Sweden? And I think um, the, the, the big problem so far has really been uh, the, uh, the, uh, that we have not been able to protect uh, yeah. uh, old people. And um, I, I, almost 90 percent of all those um, those victims and those people that have died from uh, the, the COVID um, are um, 70 years and older and uh, also a big problem in the homes for the elderly. So that's really something that has to be discussed, of course. Mm -hmm. But we don't know how to compare also yet. We, we haven't seen in, enough of it. So I think one has to be careful about... Uh, saying that they have succeeded because what happens in a, if there is a second wave and, and all of that. No. And it has apparently, this, um, uh, this COVID-19 has particular uh, characteristics uh, in how it targets uh, uh, older people. And, um, and also it is not sort of spreading in the same way as an, a normal flu, for example, but really a much more um, I don't, I don't know, more, more um, um, limited in its uh, uh, reach, but with, with very serious uh, health effects. I see. No, no, that's, that's absolutely correct. I think, um, however, though, some countries are politicizing this. And as someone who, you know, served in, within your government and also the, uh, you know, on a UN front, uh, on an international level, on a, and also from an EU perspective, when you look at it, what are the dangers of uh, politicizing this issue? What are the, what, what's at stake? Well, I, you know, this, um, this particular um, virus uh, doesn't know anything about borders. Uh, and the virus is not uh, sort of political. And we are in this together. We are all affected. And we just have to cooperate. We have to make sure that we find systems of um, of uh, coordinating what what we do. So we are we are clearly we are. This is a global pandemic, and uh, uh, we just have to ad adapt to that and continue to talk to each other, uh, continue to uh, learn from each other continue to share experiences and, of course, find a vaccine mm. that will have to be free and for everybody uh, around the world. So that's a, a very important practical task that we have mm -hmm. from now on. Well, but I've also joined a group of women where we insist on making sure that we look at the needs for women and the effects on women um, during this pandemic. And it's very clear that for example, um, they are in more precarious jobs around the world. So that is uh, one thing that has to be looked at. Uh, there is so much violence against uh, women, unfortunately, and the governments have to take decisions to make sure that they are protected, that there, there are shelters and uh, help for children and so on and so on. So on, on, in one area after the other, we can see that women also are 
are exposed and and vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, to a point that that it has to be dealt with politically. That's that's so true, and and I want to ex expand on that. But one thing that I that I witnessed myself. This is the longest that I've spent in Sweden, and I witnessed the enormous trust that people from all walks of life have in the government. And quite frankly, I have not seen that living in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Where does this come from? But that's, um, I think, an effect of a country that has been, has had the, the, the um, privilege of living in peace for a very long time, for 200 years, and we have been able to develop our society, uh, our democratic uh, structures in such a way that people have a lot of trust in. right now. Connection is a little bit shaky. We lost you for a second. Okay, let's bring Mrs. Wallstrom back again because we're having a great conversation on various leadership that we're seeing I lost you for a second. Hello? Yes, we lost each other. No, but we were making a great point about the contrast between Sweden and the United States in, in the trust that people have in the government. And I think that's, an, that's a very important point. Can you hear me now, Mrs. Wallstrom? Can you hear me? No, we're, we're trying, no, it's good. I think this question. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Yes, I can. I, I okay. hear you well. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, yeah, now we, we're back in. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I, I, if it's okay with you, um, because, perfect, but because you, an important point about the trust in the government and it got lost because of the connection issue so if you can just uh, recapture that thought I don't want us to miss your answer mm. no there there is and I, I think we can build on a long long democratic tradition in our country but also with a strong civil society with free media and a lively debate and I think it's not a blind trust in 
our leaders or government or, or authorities, but you can also question it. And I think we have to be, um, we have to take care of a system that works that way. So our openness and, uh, you know, to make, um, uh, make everything public, uh, I think it's a very good principle that Excellent. Um, Mrs. Wallstrom, what are your thoughts, uh, you know, personal thoughts on, on the way the United States is handling the pandemic and the, and, you know, the image that the U.S. is, is giving to the world and its long partners within the European Union and others in handling this pandemic? Could you hear my question? No. Oh, The connection is a bit tricky. I wonder if we should reconnect again. Because you're making such great points and I don't want to lose your fantastic, you know, insight, but the connection is a bit shaky. So I wonder if we should reconnect. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, perfect. Let's let's reconnect because we certainly don't want to miss the great answers that Mrs. Wallstrom is is giving us. Hello. Can you hear me, Mrs. Wallstrom? Okay, brilliant. You know, you're, you're asking questions. I don't No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, I guess because... Yes, exactly. Let's, let's um, you know, focus, I guess, on a few more points. Uh, you mentioned the need to support women more. And I want to talk about mental health. Uh, that's, that's a cause that's very important to me. And uh, I want to hear your thoughts on ways that you think governments should support uh, people's mental health, policies that deal with mental health, um, for women, for single mothers, for children right now, 
what are your thoughts? Because certainly we need to pay attention to, to this issue post COVID. I see. Um, I guess my last question, I, I really wish we could talk a little bit more, but the connection seems a bit, uh, you know, n not like we want it to be. But um, was there anything that you learned about yourself or anything that inspired you or came to you um, during the pandemic? About yourself, about life, what did you... What was one of your realizations? And then read books. Friends. Oh my goodness, you're, you're, and this was such a beautiful message and I just wish the connection was good because you're so right, you know, calling someone that you haven't talked for a while and, and speaking with your loved one that maybe you haven't spoken with before. Um, okay, last question, because I, I just don't want, you know, the, to lose the connection. Uh, any book recommendations that you can give me so that I share with, with the viewers?
maybe your question. I think we'll just have to, to accept that we have a too bad connection. Can I say thank you very much, uh, Tara, and uh, wish you all the best. Continue with your focus yes. on those that are most affected um, by, by this uh, crisis and uh, continue to let um, uh, all your, your friends and, and uh, also new people that you get to know um, uh, have their messages uh, through, um, through the, those uh, uh, live conversations. Good luck with everything. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Wallstrom. Uh, we were speaking with uh, uh, Margot Wallstrom, former foreign minister of Sweden. Unfortunately, we're having a little bit of a shaky conversation, so we have to end it right now. Um, but uh, I will share the, uh, the, the bites that were audible and we could hear and hopefully we'll uh, speak together again at another occasion. Thank you so much for thank being you. here. Bye -bye. And thank you for your insight. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.